All right. Hello, everyone. As said, I'm Alex Vantoff, and I'll be presenting work done at Columbia and IBM called Flux. Uh, so users are increasingly owning multiple mobile devices of various shapes and sizes. With this comes a desire to switch freely between your devices while keeping your work the same. For instance, to switch to a more portable form factor for travel or to leverage the larger keyboard of a device. Because of this, we're seeing a trend towards multi-surface computing. We see it with Google Docs, where you can switch devices and pick up with your document right where you left off. We see it with Netflix, where you can begin a video on one device and resume it on another. And we see it with Apple AirPlay, where you can stream the content of one device to another. One current approach to enabling multi-surface computing is to base applications around the cloud. But with this, we're continually having to reinvent the wheel. Every application is forced to write explicit support for, hand <laughs> for handing off content to the cloud. Involving the cloud also requires that the applications have access to the internet and prohibits their use in some environments due to, due to privacy and security concerns. In addition, this is still not as seamless as we want. You'd have to reopen the application on the target device and typically navigate a few menus before you're back to where you were. Another approach to multi-surface is screencasting. With screencasting, the screen of one stream, uh, one device, is streamed to another over the network. But with this approach, we're forced to keep the application running on the original device. So now we have that device sitting there, its battery's draining, we can't use it for anything else. Worse, since the application doesn't actually run on the target device, we can't leverage any of its performance or features. On top of this, we have to make sure the devices are kept together over a strong network connection for the entire time the app is used. So we propose a third approach, live migration of applications. We simply move the application, mid execution, from one device to another. Now you can freely use the original device for anything you want, and you can fully leverage the performance and features of the target device. Additionally, we can do this without relying on the cloud or even internet connectivity by establishing ad hoc networking between the devices. And by approaching it at the systems level, we can do this with completely unmodified applications. So what's so hard about migration? It's fairly common nowadays. VMs are migrated routine, routinely in the cloud. Well, it turns out we can't just apply existing migration techniques to the mobile space. With mobile, you have a massive variety of devices, over 20,000 different Android devices alone. Each of these contain different hardware, different screen sizes, and different onboard devices like GPUs, cameras, and GPSs. Compounding this problem is that these onboard devices are tightly integrated with the system. They're vertically implemented using their own proprietary, non-standard driver interfaces. Just trying to see the state of the devices, let alone migrate that state, is tremendously difficult. If we were to capture the device, if we were to capture the state within a VM, all these devices would have to be emulated. Not only does this hinder performance, but trying to support this vast array of devices is near impossible for a hypervisor. In addition to all this device heterogeneity, the applications are interactive and user-facing. This means they require direct access to the GPU for hardware acceleration. We somehow have to migrate this GPU state along with the app. But much like with other devices, GPUs are massive black boxes and massive code bases, so migration is pretty much impossible. Mobile applications are also interacting extensively with system-provided services, like, for example, a notification service. An app that wants to post a notification isn't going to do it itself. It's going to ask a notification service that manages all of the system's notifications to do it on its behalf. This means that a significant amount of the application state is actually residing within these services. In order to migrate the app, we're going to have to migrate this state along with it. To overcome these challenges, we created Flux. Flux allows for seamlessly moving an application from one device to another dissimilar device. For example, Flux can move an application from a phone to a tablet, with the result leveraging the larger screen of the tablet. Flux leverages the existing design of Android to, facil to facilitate two key mechanisms enabling migration, selective record, adaptive replay, and checkpoint restore in Android. Having noticed that Android apps communicate with system services through well-defined framework-level APIs, we created Selective Record Adaptive Replay. With this, we can migrate the app-specific state residing within these services and accurately recreate it on a new device. Now, in order to migrate the app itself, we also have to handle the state of any of the devices it's interacting with directly, like the GPU. To do so, we create a Checkpoint Restore in Android, or CREA. Creo leverages the characteristics of Android to place an application into a deep pause state, wherein it can then safely remove all this device-specific state. Creo can then checkpoint the critical user and OS level state of the application and restore it on a new device. Because Flux leverages the existing design of Android, it's good to cover a little bit of background information on it. And so in Android, 
applications are either in the foreground, invisible to the user, or in the background where the user is unable to interact with them. As mentioned, in the mobile space, applications are interacting extensively with system-provided services. In Android, some of these services are the camera service, the location service, and the notification service. To communicate with all of these services, Android uses a single IPC mechanism called Binder, which is implemented as a kernel driver inside of the Android kernel. As you may have guessed based on the previous example services, applications don't typically access the devices directly. Instead, they interact with system services that manages the devices on their behalf. For example, to obtain the GPS location, the location service is asked rather than opening the GPS device directly. A notable exception to this is the GPU, which applications will have to interact with directly via OpenGL. All right, so let's say we want to migrate an app with Flux. To do so, we initiate the migration using a two-finger swiping gesture on the screen. When this happens, the application will be sent to the background, placed into a deep pause state where the device state can be safely discarded, and then the app will be checkpointed. On the target device, the app will be restored from the checkpoint image, and the log of its interactions will be replayed to the system services on the new device, after which it will be brought to the foreground and be ready for use. So let's talk about the two key mechanisms enabling Flux to do this. The first, selective record, adaptive replay, of which I'm really only going to talk about selective record and leave adaptive replay for the paper. So why use this? Why selective record, adaptive replay? Well, to migrate apps correctly, we have to solve a problem. We have to be able to migrate that app-specific state that resides within the system services. In order to do so, we have to figure out some solution. So one approach is we could add checkpoint and restore hooks to all of the system services, and then we could extract and inject that app-specific state. But this isn't going to work because some of the state may be device-specific. And even if we could overcome that issue, implementing these hooks requires knowing the fine-grained implementation details of every system service. Given the number of services and their complexity, the time required just to understand exactly what needs to be checkpointed would be substantial, let alone to actually implement it. So how about we record the calls that the application makes to the system services, and then we can replay them on the new device's services. This is certainly easier to implement and maintain, but the result's going to be wrong in most cases. For example, if an app toggles a sensor on and off while it runs, we don't actually want to replay every sensor on and off action. We just want the end state of the sensor to match. Similarly, we don't want to replay an app's notifications if they've already been acknowledged. In addition, a straightforward replay leaves us no rooms to adapt calls in order to account for device to differences in devices. So instead of a straightforward, one-size-fits-all approach to recording and replaying, we introduce selective record replay. With this, we selective re selectively record calls to system services and then adaptively replay them to account for any device differences. With selective recording, we'll only record the calls to system services that affect the current service state. Calls that no longer affect the state are automatically discarded. For example, if an application requests that a sensor be turned on, that's a call that we have to record and replay. But if the if, uh, at request that the sensor be turned on and then back off again, we can ignore both of those calls. But how do we know which calls should be recorded and which should be ignored? Well, we leverage the higher level semantics of system service APIs. In the definitions of system service interfaces, we add a small amount of annotation, or what we call decorators, indicating what should be recorded. In Android, these interfaces are defined using the Android interface definition language, better known as ADL. They're part of the core Android framework code base. Uh, so for example, here we have a simplified ADL definition of Android's notification service API, Notification Manager. It consists of two methods. The first, in queue notification, takes two arguments, the ID of the notification being posted and the notification object itself. And the second, cancel notification, takes a single argument specifying the ID of the notification to remove. During compilation of the framework, this interface definition will be run through ADL, and the necessary Java code for implementing the RPC interface will be generated. So to alter this definition such that these methods are recorded, we add our decorators. First, we indicate the calls to these methods should be recorded and replayed by decorating them with at record. However, we don't want to perform a straightforward record replay because then we'll be replaying app notifications that have already been acknowledged. So, we add a drop statement specifying that when cancel notification is called, we actually want to drop all previous calls to itself and in queue notification. However, obviously we don't want to blindly drop every call to in queue notification, just those related to the notification being canceled. 
So we qualify the drop statement with an if statement indicating that only prior calls with the matching ID argument should be dropped. Now we're correctly recording calls to enqueue notification, but dropping them if a subsequent call to cancel notification is made with the same ID. The table here provides a listing of all the decorated Android services, along with the number of methods in each interface and the number of lines of code required for the deflux decorators. As you can see, the decorators are easy to add, and the number of lines of code for required for them is minimal, with most services requiring fewer than 50 lines. Total number of lines required for the decorators was less than 1,000. Generally speaking, services with larger interfaces are going to require more lines of code to decorate. It's worth emphasizing that these service interfaces are implemented within the framework, and it's intended that framework engineers will write and maintain these decorators. App developers don't even have to know they exist. Next, I'm going to discuss the other key mechanism of Flux, Checkpoint Restore on Android. Checkpoint Restore on Android is used to migrate the process and device state of an application. By process state, we're including things like the application memory, file descriptors, et cetera. To handle this, we leverage the Checkpoint Restore and User Space project, better known as CRIU. This is an open VZ backed project that's been in the mainline Linux kernel since version 3.11. I'm not going to go into the details of how it works, but if you're interested, I encourage you to check it out later. We extend CRIU to create Checkpoint Restore on Android, or CRIA, and with CRIA, we're able to handle the device specific state residing within applications and support Android specific kernel drivers like the Binder IPC driver. Due to time constraints, I'll leave the details of supporting the Android specific drivers to the paper and focus on the handling of device state within the applications. So to handle the device state within these apps, we note that most devices don't actually have to be handled. Since they're used indirectly via system services, they're already taken care of with selective record adaptive replay. The notable exception, notable exception to this is the GPU. Um, it's important to note that in Android, much of the code path used when starting an app is reused when bringing the app back to the foreground. Therefore, much of the code that sets up the GPU access in an app relies on conditional initialization. That is, if an object isn't already initialized, it will be. For example, when we turn to the foreground, if an OpenGL context has already been created and still exists, nothing will happen. But if that context doesn't exist, that context will be created. Because of this, we handle GPU state simply by safely discarding it and then leveraging conditional initialization during restoration. This way, we can expect the GPU state will be recreated once the app has been migrated and brought back to the foreground. So to discard this GPU state, we first send the app to the background. This will cause the app to cease drawing and its drawing surfaces will be removed. We then leverage Android's existing low memory handling capabilities to spoof a low memory condition for the app. This will cause the app to release further graphical resources such as shaders and cache textures. In addition, we'll remove the OpenGL context here. At this point, almost all of the GPU state has been removed. However, Android uses proprietary native libraries to, uh, native libraries to implement device-specific OpenGL state uh, details. These libraries may have a lingering state store that we don't know about and can't get to. To eliminate this, we extend the generic Android OpenGL interface to add an EGL unload function. This function will unload these proprietary graphics libraries and along with them their state. This way, once the app is resumed, the initialization state will see that the proprietary libraries haven't been loaded and will load in the new devices libraries. All right. Having covered both of the key mechanisms used by Flux, I'll move on to the evaluation of the system. So to evaluate Flux, we wanted to verify that unmodified applications can be migrated successfully. To do so, we went on to Google Play and grabbed 18 of the most popular applications available. <laughs> well-known apps like Candy Crush, Saga, Snapchat, and Instagram. We then subjected the, all these applications to migration across several different devices and measured the amount of time it takes. For this, we used three devices in four different scenarios. The first scenario was migration from a second-gen Nexus 7 tablet to another second-gen Nexus 7 tablet. Here, both the hardware and the form factor remain constant across migration. For the second scenario, we migrated from a Nexus 4 phone to a second-gen Nexus 7 tablet. Here the hardware remains similar, but the form factor changes from a small phone to a larger tablet. For the third scenario, we migrated from a first-gen Nexus 7 tablet to a second-gen Nexus 7 tablet. Here the form factor remains similar, but the hardware differs significantly. For the final scenario, we migrated from a first-gen Nexus 7 tablet to a Nexus 4 phone. Here both the hardware and form factor change significantly. So here we have the overall migration time across all four scenarios for each of the applications. Total time is on the y-axis, and the application being migrated is on the x. Each bar represents a scenario as indicated by the key in the upper right. 
Overall, migration took an average of 7.88 seconds for all applications across all scenarios. More resource-intensive applications, such as games like Candy Crush Saga and Bubble Witch Saga, skew this average higher, as do scenarios involving the first-gen Nexus 7 due to its poor Wi-Fi adapter that has to operate in the congested 2.4 gigahertz band. This is particularly noticeable when migrating between it and a Nexus 4, as indicated by the yellow bar bars. You may have noticed that subway surfers and Facebook were absent from that chart, even though they were in the original 18 applications. This is because subway surfers makes use of an Android API method that allows apps to persist their OpenGL context even while in the background. Since Flux relies on eliminating this context, apps using it aren't able to be migrated. However, few applications actually make use of this call. In fact, we studied 500,000 Google Play applications and found that fewer than 0.01% of all of them used it. Facebook, on the other hand, failed to migrate because it's implemented as multiple processes. This is strictly a technical shortcoming of Flux, and more engineering work can overcome it. Here we break down the migration time to show what portion of the overall time was spent during which stage. The first stage, preparation, involves sending the app to the background and discarding of GPU state. The second stage, checkpoint, is the time required for create a checkpoint the application and create an image. The third stage transfer is the time spent transferring the checkpoint and image and uh, application data across devices. The fourth stage restore is the time required for CREA to restore the, the uh, checkpoint and image. And the final stage reintegration is the time spent for replaying the system service calls and bringing the app back to the foreground. As you can see, the transfer stage dominates the overall migration time with over 50% of the time spent during that stage. We expect that this network transfer time will continually improve with device hardware and better networks. In addition, we can do things like hide the preparation and checkpoint stages as the user initiates migration and selects the target device. Taking this into account and eliminating the transfer time, we can obtain the following optimal perceived migration times. Here we see that as a lower bound, users can be expected to perceive an average migration of 1.35 seconds. To verify the Flux adds negligible overhead to overall system performance, we ran widely used mobile benchmarks. We then compared the results of Flux to the unmodified Android open source project that Flux is based on and found the overhead to be negligible and within test variability. This is expected as there's typically few system service calls occurring in the background while the applications run. So now for a quick video demo of Flux in action. Uh, for this demonstration, we're going to be migrating from the Nexus 4 phone on the left to the Nexus 2nd Gen Nexus 7 tablet on the right. Uh, we've already gone ahead and installed Polaris Office, a popular Office productivity app from Google Play, onto the Nexus 4. And uh, I'll begin by opening the Polaris Office app on the Nexus 4. Then we'll wait a few seconds for it to load. And now that it's loaded, I'll go ahead and create a new text document. Then zoom in so I can see what I'm typing. Then I'll start work on the document by typing this is. It might be a little hard to see for you guys. Uh, and then to initiate the migration, I'll use a two finger swiping gesture like that. And now what we see is the app has been sent to the background. It's been placed into a deep pause state. The GPU state has been removed, and it's now in the process of being transferred over the network. It's about 10 megabytes of compressed data, so it takes a couple of seconds. So now we see it's reappeared on the Nexus 7, right where it left off, showing this is, it's already been typed. And I'll complete my message by adding flux, making it this is flux. In conclusion, we've created a working prototype of Flux, allowing for multi-surface computing through application migration. Flux leverages the two key mechanisms of selective record, adaptive replay, and checkpoint restore in Android. With our prototype, we demonstrated migration of unmodified, popular applications straight from Google Play with acceptable migration time. With further optimizations and improved hardware, we believe we can bring these migration times down even further. Thank you, and are there any questions? Right in front here. So hi, here uh, Cheng Tan from New York University. So 
uh, this flux is pretty much analogy to the you know process migration in a classic uh, old days. So my question would be: So how can you handle you know the tricks in the old days? For example, the network connection, and uh, you know, if I was watch watching a movie, I use your flux to another device. Well, well, your flux you know migrate that you know huge movies to 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 another device. Right. And how can you predict other you know? If I this program will open a file inside this device, but not exist in another device, how can you handle all these tricks? Thank you. Uh, for the network connectivity, we leverage the fact that applications on mobile devices are already kind of made with the idea that the network connectivity is going to be transient, and we'll take into account that it, the network may drop out on them, so they'll buffer the video and handle it seamlessly. Um, for if a device doesn't exist, uh, that's going to be part of the adaptive replay, so it'll see it and. It could refuse to migrate it, or it could just uh, tunnel the uh, communication of that device over the network. OK, thank you. Uh, Derek Murray, Google. Um, so first of all, really nice talk. Could you go back to the slide on the breakdown of migration overhead? Cool. So thinking back to this morning's talk on application-assisted uh, migration of uh, Java apps, do you have a feel for how much of this transfer time is moving garbage around? Um, we've done a little bit of experimenting with like post copy and such. Uh, there's a fair amount of garbage, especially just due to the inefficiency of, uh, inefficiencies of Delvic. Um, using Arc, the images are much smaller, but we don't have results for that. Um, Some of it's inherent. I mean, you've got Snapchat there, but yeah. Uh, Vikram Madhve, University of Illinois. Uh, it's nice work. It's a lot of work, clearly. Thank you. Uh, I have a clarification and one question. The clarification is, you said that you used, uh, I think, Android 4.4 KitKat for all your experiments. Is there some dependence on the operating system? Do you, exp do you require that the OS on both devices be, I I be the same? Uh, the, the OS version can vary slightly between devices, but if you're going between major versions, the private APIs that the Android framework libraries are using to communicate with the private services may change, and that can cause issues. So if you, were to want to, if you wanted to support cross-version migration, you'd have to ensure that Google didn't change those private APIs in between versions. And the question is, applications in, are increasingly trying to use the GPU and other uh, accelerators for computation. So it's not just OpenGL, for example. and. Uh, oh. Google now has a language called RenderScript for doing compute on the GPU. And that could potentially introduce more state that's within the GPU itself, and it's not just initialization of OpenGL connections. Do you think that you'll be able to migrate applications that use the GPU in that way or other components? Um, possibly. It depends on how it's implemented. I'm not particularly familiar with uh, that kind of stuff, but it's potentially possible. Hi, um, I have two questions. First of all, sorry if I didn't understand everything you said, so maybe it would be redundant, but anyway. Um, my first question was, uh, how do you handle authentication between the devices in order not to let anyone drop any application on your device when you don't want to? I'm sorry, could you say that again? Uh, yeah, sure. How do you identify both parties in the devices in order to um, prevent a malicious user, for instance, to update application to your device? You mean, I mean the pairing of the device? You say I have two devices and I want them both to share applications, basically, and uh, I wanted to say, okay, if I'm a malicious user in your house, on your Wi-Fi, for instance, how do you prevent me from uh, transferring an application to yours? Um, you, there's an initial pairing phase that you'll, kind of like Bluetooth, you'll say that these devices, devices are able to migrate between each other. And during that pairing phase, uh, various libraries and such are synced between, along with the application files. OK. And the second question was, um, you have spoken about OpenVZ that you have backport on Android, right? Yeah. So it doesn't work on um, vanilla Android. You have to flash your phone in order to get your patch or stuff like that? Yes. Um, okay. I mean, the actual new devices are running probably uh, 3.11 kernels, I'm sure. But whether or not they've actually enabled the uh, the CRIU uh, config settings, I'm not sure. So generally, yeah, you'll have to flash the new OS image. OK, thank you. Okay. Let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>